All right, y'all. So I'm not going to be here for today, at least for this class, because I have something else I have to do. Um, I'm giving you the option right now. You can just run through the slides on your own and read through all the stuff and do all the Pear Deck stuff because it's student paced anyways. Or you can watch this video to guide you through as you go. Some of y'all like to be more independent, which is fine. Some of y'all do need the guidance. Up to you which one you want to do. Um, so I'm going to provide this video just in case. Today's topic is taxonomy of organisms, and it's mostly B8. If you need the cheat sheet, it should be available in the classroom to pick up and return. But if you need to, you can also look on Canvas. It's linked there under today's date. So the main idea is um, asking what is taxonomy? And taxonomy is just our classification that we organize all living things. Um, it makes a hierarchy, meaning that there's levels of this organization of complexity down to like super, super simple specific levels to group organisms based on who they're mostly related to. It's basically like one big family tree of life. And it does seem pretty complicated when you look at it large scale. But when you're focusing on like an individual species at a time, it's not that bad. Um, as you can see over here in this diagram on the right side, we've seen it before, but uh, in each kingdom, there's going to be multiple phylums. And you can see in this picture, there's one phylum that we've taken and we've expanded. And in every phylum, there's going to be multiple classes. And you take one of those and expand it. And in every class, there's multiple orders. Take one of those, expand it to look into it. There's multiple families in an order. And in every family, you can expand that. And there's multiple genuses. And then you expand the genuses. And you can see that there's multiple species that belong to each genus. Notice at the bottom, though. But the species do not have multiple within them. Species is as specific as you get, hence the name. And you don't go any more into detail than species. And species, as we know, are very, very uh, niche groups. Species of different kinds cannot interbreed. They cannot really interact in the same ways um, as, I guess, like in the community sense, they're going to be interacting on a more base level because they are the same type of organism, right? But when you go from a kingdom, it's really, really broad. So you can't really say that uh, uh, it's a good identifier if you're going from the kingdom level. But if you can give a species name or you can give characteristics of a species, it means that they're really physically similar and they're really genetically similar. Now, who created taxonomy? Um the father of taxonomy was known as Carolus Linnaeus. You do have to recognize his name. Um, the spelling isn't as important as long as you get kind of close to it when they ask you a question. And he also created the binomial nomenclature system, which is what we are able to use to give every organism a scientific name. And that's that two-part Latin name that we've talked about and worked with before. It's uh, kind of weird sounding when you say them out loud because Latin is a dead language. But you know, for example, we have homo sapiens for humans. You've heard them before. They are used in every single thing that's alive, including like bacteria, including fungi, animals, plants, protista, all have a scientific name. This enhances our abilities as scientists to kind of communicate across different countries about organisms that we discover and making sure we're not double dipping on organisms and being like, oh, I discovered it. No, well, it's already been discovered here at this time because the scientific name matches. It also helps us decide if organisms are really closely related because if they have the same literal species name, they're the same kind of organism. But if they have the same kind of genus, but not species, they're pretty close, but they're not exactly the same. Anything after that, they're not that closely related anymore. I want you to type out your answer for this question. Just to summarize the last couple of slides that we've been talking about. The question is, why do we use the taxonomy classification system? Go ahead and pause this video as you're doing that. All right, so the answer is essentially this. Um, it's kind of specific. If you want to put it into your own words to kind of fix your answer, that's totally okay. It says taxonomy keeps the relationships between species and their ancestors all organized. Scientific communities all over the world use the same taxonomic system in order to make communications clear about species extinctions and discoveries. Um, so it's mainly about organization and communication. How taxonomy works is that we're going to be looking at DNA, structure, and behavior of organisms to group them. And the more similar they are for these three things, the more closely we're going to group them together, obviously. The thing is, technology is continually advancing. So we might be grouping things differently in the future. We might be grouping things differently currently already compared to in the past. That's because we're just getting better at analyzing these organisms that we have and have known about. Evolution is also ongoing. So with nature changing, with environments changing, with a lot of climates changing because of human impact, 
um, evolution is going to be affecting organisms and their development and developing of new species. So um, we might have new things to categorize as time goes on. When we look at taxonomy earlier, I talked about how it goes kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. This is a pretty good visual diagram of um, the biggest categories, kingdom, and the smallest category, species. And it's very general up at kingdom because I could say mm, there's an animal outside. I've used this example before. And you would be like, what kind of animal? Right? It doesn't give very many details if I just say an animal because it's in kingdom animalia. But it's something. You know, it's a eukaryote. You know, it has to eat things for energy. But you don't really know anything else about it. <laughs> if I give you a species, though, I'm like, oh, it's a squirrel. You'll know what it is instead of just saying it's a generalized animal in the kingdom, right? So giving a species is very specific, closely related organisms that are very uh, easy to identify versus just saying an animal. Here's an example that we did before in class where we looked at the kingdom and uh, phylum and class order family genus species of one organism. And you can see that every level each organism has a name in every level. We don't refer to them by all these levels because that would be a huge mouthful and also very, very complicated. We just use these last two, the genus and the species together because they already give us the most details. Um, but these other levels are known and able to be explained. So for example, the jaguar here is kingdom animalia. Duh, it's an animal. We knew that. It's not a plant. It's not a fungus, right? It's in the phylum chordatum, which means it has a cord a spinal cord in its back. Within the chordata, it's a mammal. There are chordates or spinal corded animals that are not mammals, for example, like reptiles, right? Inside of the mammals, it's a carnivore. So it belongs to the order carnivora. Inside of the carnivores, it belongs to Felidae, the family Felidae. Inside of Felidae, it belongs to the genus Panthera. And within the species, it's going to just be called Pardus from within Panthera. So we use the Genus plus the species as the scientific name, the two-part Latin name in binomial nomenclature, that's Panthera pardus for the jaguar. Now, organisms that share more levels means that they are more closely related. Obviously, if you share all of the levels, then you're literally the same species, so then you can reproduce with each other, and you are exactly the same kind of animal. If you only share the first couple levels, like kingdom and phylum, you're not that closely related, but you're somewhat related, right? If you're not even in the same kingdom, then you're like really not related. That's like saying like a bacteria and uh, an elephant, right? They're not that closely related because they're not even the same kingdom. But there are animals, for example, that will match all the way up to mammalia, which means they're kind of related because they also have a spinal cord. They're also animals and they're also warm-blooded and produce milk for their babies. But the other things are different. So they're somewhat related, okay? I have um, a question for you here to practice. Sorry, let me move out of the way kind of. Um, for these two examples, I want you to place the green star on the genus and the purple heart on the species of both names. So you should be putting a green star on the horse's scientific name and a green star on the wolf's scientific name on the genus part. And then I want you to put the purple heart on the species part of both names. So on this page, I should see two green stars and two purple hearts. And they should not be overlapping because they're different parts of the name. Take a pause. Go ahead and do that. All right. Your answer should be showing that, uh, oops, my bad, that the green stars are on Equus and Canis. The first part of every scientific name is always a genus. And you can also tell that because it's the capitalized name. The second part of the name is always the species. So I should see a purple heart on Cabayas and Lupus separately. Notice that, again, they're not overlapping with any of the other shapes, with any of the other names. The second word is also never capitalized because the species is just never capitalized. That's how it works in binomial nomenclature. We did this before where you guys had kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and you were like, um, that's kind of hard to memorize. Well, there's mnemonic devices like King Philip came over for great soup. Katy Perry came over for green shoes. I'm going to have you write your own. Now, I just said two of them, so you can't use either of those two. But if you use, like, came over four, that's fine. You just got to come up with different words for the K, P, G, S parts so that it can be unique and it can be your own so you remember it better. Write down your own mnemonic device, pause, and do that. All right, kind of related to taxonomy and organization, 
what is a cladogram? Well, we've seen these tree kind of looking shapes and they show us visually how organisms are related to each other throughout evolutionary time. Now, it's not actually scaled to time because we know that we have punctuated equilibrium where it's not evenly spaced out nicely like this tree. But it does show us that at different characteristic traits developing throughout time, we have different species branching out that have the traits or don't have the traits. So when there's a trait here, for example, like jaws, if you're on the right side of the tree, you have that character. If you don't have it, then you're on the left side. Like this hagfish right here, no jaws. Perch, salamander, lizards, pigeons, mice, and chimps all have jaws. So you can see right side has it, left side doesn't have it. And that goes for every single trait here. Either you have it or you don't have it based on if your branch is coming before or after. And when I say before, I literally mean tracing from the bottom to the top, or sometimes it's left to right. It's wherever the base of the tree is starting. Be careful though. They'll change the direction that it's going. You just have to look where the stem is, okay? Again, this cladogram shows us everything that's currently living. Usually cladograms are about current species. Time starts at the stem and goes forward. It can be going left to right, though. And the nodes are where they're splitting. And the nodes are also generally where the uh, characteristics are going to be noted where you have it, you don't have it. Left side, right side, before, after. Just read it carefully. Take your time. Start from the stem and move forward throughout time. So we're going to do a drag and drop here. Which organism is the least closely related to birds, crocodiles, rabbits, and primates? You got to first locate all of those. And then you're going to drop your red dot on the organism that is least closely related. This is curiously confusing language because on the star test, you're going to get weird wording like this. Least closely related. Go ahead and try. The organism here that we want to locate first are the birds, crocodiles, rabbits, and primates. So it's these four on the right side. And we want to look at who is least closely related, which means we're technically looking at who's the furthest away, right? So if we're looking at who is the furthest away, easy. Sharks. That's also because these four have one, two, three nodes away from the shark, right? They have a bunch of splits away from the shark and they have a lot of characteristics that they have that sharks don't have. So those are also easy explanations as to why they're not very closely or least closely related. A dichotomous key, y'all have actually done a lot of these. We did a lot of practice. Y'all were pretty good at it too. Um, it's a diagram that helps us identify organisms based on their characteristics that we can see with their eyeballs when we're observing them in nature or in their habitat or after we you know, capture them. And it's a yes, no kind of thing. You either have it or you don't. And you'll be able to go this way, go this way from step one all the way to step four to decide what the eventual name of the organism is since you have a key. Here's an example. We actually have straight up done this one before. You're looking at this picture right here and you're going to always start at step one, as it says here, like a recipe, always start at step one. If you start in the middle, you have no idea where you are. You have no idea what to do. And you read the instructions under step one. It says, A, if the fish shape is long and skinny, go to step two. If the fish shape is not long and skinny, go to step three. And so if the fish shape right here, I don't know about you, but it doesn't look long and skinny to me. So I'm going to go to step three. You're going to follow that until you get to a name instead of a go to step blah 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 step three says if the fish has both eyes on top of its head go to step four and b says if the fish has one eye on each side of its head go to step five the eyes are on top of its head since this is a little flat fish and in step four we're going to see if the fish has a long whip like tail it is a spotted eagle ray if the fish has a short blunt tail it is a peacock flounder well this tail Sure does look like a whip to me. So it's going to be a spotted eagle ray. And that will be the name of this organism. Yay. Nice. I'm going to have you look at some guided practice. And then you're going to do some independent practice on some questions using the rake method. Remember, it's read, highlight, ask the question in your own words, share your knowledge on this topic, and then eliminate and choose the best answer. So in this question, I have the relationships among different orders of millipedes are shown in the cladogram. And then I have a cladogram that goes left to right. Again, the start is over here because the stem is over there. At the bottom, it says, based on this cladogram, which statement best describes relationships among millipede orders? So these are millipedes. I don't know what they are just based on the name, obviously, but I don't need to because the cladogram gave me all the information. So first off, I just read it. I want to highlight out the important stuff. Um, it's pretty important that it's a cladogram. 
right? So we're going to be reading one. The cladogram itself is also important. So if you wanted to highlight that, totally would. And then the important stem inside of the question is best describes the relationships, which means that some of these will be correct, but some of these will just be better than others, okay? Um, I highlighted out stuff in the answer choices too, because I want to see which ones I'm comparing. All of these answer choices say more closely related. So that's consistent. Don't have to worry about that after I note it in the first place. And then I'm going to be looking at the pairs, Okay, the question I am going to rephrase, it's asking about the relationships between the millipede orders and the cladogram, and it's asking me to compare two relationships at a time to see which one is the most close or the more close one. Okay, just clarification for myself. I know I technically wrote a question or statement longer than the question itself, but this way it was more clear to me understanding what I was trying to find. Okay, well, I know the cladogram goes from left to right. It's not top to or bottom to top, which is fine. Um, and I also know that when there's less branches between the orders, they're closer. For example, like these two, there's only like one branch here. They're closely related versus if you go all the way back here and trace all the way back here, there's a lot more splits in between them. So they're not as closely related. So that's what we're going to be looking for. Who is the least far away or who's the closest physically on this tree? All right. So let's look at our choices. I was able to cancel out a bunch of these when I was looking at my choices because Spirostreptida right here and glomerita right here. Spirostreptida, I have to go one, two, three, four splits to get over to glomerita. Four is a pretty high number. Spherotherida and glomerita are right next to each other. So that's just one right here. So this pair over here in the blue is actually closer than the red. Therefore, that statement is wrong. Polyzenita and glomerodesmita right here. Polyzenita, glomerodesmita. One, two, three. Bosphera and glomeris demeta uh, is right here with only one. So again, three is not closer than one. Wrong. Marikita and glomera desmita. One, two, three, four. Four is a pretty high number again. Glomerita and glomera desmita are right next to each other again, just one. So four is not closer than one. We're left with looking at F now. Stemulita is more closely related to Marikita. Stemulita and Marikita are one away. Penicilliata and Marikita are, dang, Marikita, one, two, three, four away. So in this case, this first pair is only one and the second pair is four. You're just counting at this point. It's a lot of work, it feels like, but it doesn't require you to have that much prior knowledge other than how to read a cladogram. So F is correct because one is less than four. All right, independent practice. I'm going to ask you to try out this on your own. Honestly, I did the hardest one for y'all. So what you're going to do is you're going to run through these next four questions here, here, here. Oh, just three. Nice. And you're going to make sure that you do the read and highlight. I need to see that. I need you to rephrase your question in the purple box. I need you to share at least one, maybe two pieces of knowledge on your topic that you know or using your note sheet to help you. And I need you to eliminate the wrong answers. If you can eliminate the reasons why by breaking down the answer choices even better and choose the best answer by the end so I can grade it. I will be looking at these at the end of the school day because obviously it's the end of the grading period. So sorry I'm out, but I will be getting this done for you. I promise. Um, that does mean that you have to get it done too prior to the end of the school day because I need to be able to grade it. Um, and that's all I have. So once you finish that, if you have time, do the exit ticket. Um, it's only a couple questions. Not too bad. All right. Again, sorry for being out. Thanks for getting your work done and uh, hope I see you on next week.